Hi, good evening. So we have a special surprise for everyone. My name is Omar Kanat. I am the executive director of the Uyghur Human Rights Project and the executive committee chairman of the World Uyghur Congress. And Mr. Dolkun Esa is the president of the World Uyghur Congress. So uh, this is a tone, a Chapan, tone Chapan. So uh, it is a Uyghur rob, and uh, it is presented uh, to a, only to uh, most respected, prestigious uh, members of the community. Uh, so, uh, and it is a very important part of the Uyghur uh, tradition. So uh, on behalf of the Uyghurs around the world, uh, we want to uh, present these robes to uh, Ambassador Brownback and Ms. Katrina Lantos-Sweat. As a, as a token of thanks and appreciation for their uh, extraordinary, extraordinary support, extraordinary help, and uh, uh, their work on behalf to, to advocate on behalf of the Uyghur and other most vulnerable people around the world. And also we congratulate uh, Ambassador Brownback and uh, Ms. Uh, Katrina Lantos uh, for their leadership and ama on, on amazing uh, summit, uh, amazing successful summit. Yeah. yeah. Would you like to say a few words? Well, as Omer cannot say, this is doppa and the tone. It is very simple, but it is very special for the Uyghur people and all Central Asia, Kazakh, Uzbek, Kyrgyz people. This is the symbol of the Uyghur identity, and it is a symbol of the respect to the honorable guests. So that's why we, this is the gift for the Uyghurs in the diaspora and the Uyghurs in the, our homeland in Turkestan. So Ambassador Brambeck, Sam Brambeck, and uh, Lantos, Mrs. Lantos, they are, you are both being of voice of the voiceless people, like Uyghur people. So without your help, we cannot success. Without your help, today, Nobody knows the Uyghur issue. Today, because of your help, no Uyghur genocide, ongoing genocide, and more, uh, taking more international attention. That's why we say thanks to you. I'm honored. Uh, I'm impressed with the uh, Uyghurs fighting spirit. I just don't think the Chinese communists knew who they were taking on. <laughs> and I know who I'm betting on on winning this fight between the Chinese Communist Party and the Uyghurs. I'm betting on the Uyghurs. They're going to win. 
and they've got a fighting spirit, and they'll stand up, and I'm just, I'm impressed. Well, we're wrapping it up, uh, folks. We, Katrina and I, I couldn't ask for a better co-chair. Uh, I'm just such an admirer of her and her family, uh, and they've just done a brilliant job, and her and, and just her entire team has just been fantastic. Uh, and I, they've been wonderful to work with. I want you to recognize a couple quick people as we wrap this up. We do all of this with one person most of the year. Uh, and that's a young man by the name of Peter Burns. And I want to bring Peter up on the stage and recognize Peter. <laughs> Peter, way to go. <laughs> Stand <and> go. <laughs> How about a comment? Thank you all so much. It's a pleasure to work with you all. None of this would happen without all of your input and all of your investment. And uh, so we're grateful and honored to be part of this with you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Are your parents still here? They're still here. Where are they? Your parents are still here, aren't they? Your Where parents they? stand up. Uh, Wait, they're here. There they are, right out there front. There they are. Thank you. <laughs> From central Illinois, I think, aren't they? Welcome. Good to have you guys here. Stay here for just a minute. The other person I want to, I've got a couple of people just real quick to recognize. The whole program, we had 100 speakers. And you may have felt like, oh, yeah, I know you had 100 speakers. <laughs> I am about to faint. The guy, though, that had to structure all that was Matthias Pertula. He chaired the program Woo! committee. <laughs> Matthias? He did a great job. <laughs> High five. Way to go. Thank you, thank you. Good. How about a comment? Sure. So 101st speaker. 101st. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's an honor and a privilege, and this is just a um, huge honor to serve all of you to put on this in, uh, incredible program. I believe God really blessed it. We had a great couple of days here. Sorry a couple of the plenaries went a little bit longer, but I think we did really well. We accomplished a lot of good work to, here, and if the worst thing that we can do is to have a great conference and then do nothing. Now we're going to start doing the real work that we all do throughout the years. So thank you for all that you do. And then one other guy I really want to recognize, this all takes a lot of financing, and there was one guy that literally was pulling his hair out to get all the money pulled together and keep everybody kind of moving forward and the hotel half satisfied and everything. Paul Murray is the vice chair of the Earth Secretariat. Paul, where are you? Come on up, Paul. <laughs> all right. He may have, he may have fainted. Uh, I don't know. But anyway, I, I, if you get a chance to see Paul, thank him for it, because it's just been really tough. And then Annie McKinney has also been the assistant director of the overall event. Annie, are you around? And she's handled all the registration. I wanted to really recognize her. Greg's got a great team, and they are, they're taking this on the road. So this is, uh, this is going to expand. It's going to expand to a number of different places. Just as I close out on my comments before I turn it over to Katrina, thank you. And we, I, we genuinely, genuinely love all of you and are deeply appreciative of you and what you're doing. And you just inspire me. Every time I go out in the hallway, I hear another story of what somebody's doing here or they're doing there. It's just an incredible movement. Uh, and this, this movement... We stand for millions of people that are persecuted. You know that. You know who you're talking to all the time. And so we get a nice meal and we get a nice program, uh, but we, we all know why we're doing this. We all know why Ennis Freedom, who's my new favorite NBA basketball player, <laughs> uh, uh, why he does this. It's because of the millions that are suffering. You know, I mean, we don't do it for the awards, it's for the millions billions in some cases, and we just keep after it, keep going. We don't grow weary in doing good, and, don't, and you won't, and please don't, because this is just too important. There are too many people dependent upon us. We quit, things crash, and it's not, it's not anywhere near perfect, but there are a lot more people surviving today and out of jail because you are active, and there'd be a lot more people dead and in jail if you weren't active. That's just the basic raw facts of it. So we, we just got to keep going. And so have a good night tonight, get some good rest, have a rest over the weekend and pick it, pick the ball back up on 
Tuesday if you're 4th of July. You know, I don't want to expect you to work on the 4th of July, but, but we got to pick it right back up. And the United States has to lead on this. We don't push on. It's not going to happen. So keep after it. God bless you all. It's been a great joy to serve as your co-chair uh, of this event. <laughs> Katrina? Thank you. Well, before I share a few final thoughts, I have an exciting announcement, which is that the Ennis Cantor Freedom blank canvas shoes ultimately went for $2,250. So you guys really stepped up. And I want to recognize Simran, and forgive me if I don't pronounce this quite properly, but it's Stuel Penagel is the winning bidder. So Simran, wherever you are, bravo and well done. And I think it's so lovely. He, Nadine, pay attention. He is gifting the shoes to Nadine Mayenza for standing for all wow. people. This donation is only a small fraction of the NBA salary Ennis left on the table because he stands for the truth. And we are so grateful to all of our generous bidders and are really excited for next year's Freedom Sneakers. So that's sort of the, the fun and exciting announcement. I have to say that as we draw to the close of this extraordinary three days, my heart is really very, very full. As I look around this room, and when you stand up here, the lights are bright, so I just see, see the outlines of most of you. But I have such a deep sense of connection to you, and I want to share a story. Somebody came up to me um, earlier today and said, you have a lot of stories. <laughs> and it's true. I think as a mother of seven children, I had to acquire a lot of stories to, to help us navigate through our busy lives. But as you can imagine, I think you know I'm the daughter of two Holocaust survivors. And so the history of World War II is something I am really very fascinated by. There's never, you know, too many books for me to read or movies to watch because I feel it was such a pivotal moment in our human history, a moment really when the forces of goodness writ large had to confront truly the forces of evil. And I came across a really powerful story from that period of time. By 1941, of course, Nazi Germany had largely swept across Europe. So many countries had fallen, Poland, Denmark, Norway, Luxembourg, Belgium, France, Greece. The progress of the Nazi war machine seemed to be unstoppable. And one nation at that point stood alone, England. And it had a leader, an extraordinary leader, but he knew, he knew with every fiber of his being that England alone could never survive, could never defeat the Nazis that really the future of civilization hung in the balance and hung on the question of whether or not the United States, this great power of what Winston Churchill often called the new world, whether it would come to the aid of civilization, whether it would step up. And meanwhile, on the other side of the Atlantic, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, our president, faced a, a skeptical public and a skeptical Congress. Americans, for better or for worse, by nature, have a bit of a tendency towards isolationism. And he did not, President Roosevelt, have an easy or clear path ahead to persuading his nation of the absolute urgency of stepping forward at this time of ultimate peril for the world. So he sent his uh, closest advisor, Harry Hopkins, to England in early 1941. And really, this emissary was sent with one purpose and one mission. And that was to really be Franklin Roosevelt's eyes and ears, to assess, to make a, a determination as to how, how determined the British people were. Did they have the backbone, the steel in their spine, the wherewithal to withstand what they were enduring at that time, nightly bombing raids that were pulverizing London and all the major cities, a land invasion threatened perhaps at any moment. Um, would, they, would they stay the course? Were they worth backing, even with something like the Lend-Lease program? 
Well, Churchill truly believed that everything hung in the balance. And he took Harry Hopkins, who was not actually a very well man, up and down England from city to city, showing him everything, trying with all of Churchill's persuasive might to convince him that England was worth betting on, that this fight was a fight America needed to be in. And some of his um, advisors and assistants sort of described how Churchill really was wooing him as no man ever wooed a woman because he really felt that, uh, that the fate of the world um, rested on persuading him of the importance. So finally, a sort of last dinner arrived um, and Hopkins would be returning to the United States. And as um, the, the evening sort of reached its moment of culmination and Churchill asked Harry Hopkins to say a few words, he stood up and he said, I know you want to know what I'm going to tell President Roosevelt. And then he paused and he said, my answer is found in the book of books. And then he quoted one of the great women of the Bible, Ruth. And he said, apparently in quite a hushed voice, whither thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people will be my people, and thy God, my God. And Hopkins added, even unto the end. And those who were there for this dinner reported that at those words, Churchill wept because he knew that he wouldn't and England wouldn't be alone forever. And a, an almost palpable wave of relief swept over the room because amid all the tension, all the death, all the destruction, all the fear that they were living with, those words, those beautiful biblical words, were really like a rope of hope to them. And that story came to me as I thought about the way I feel about the people in this room. My brothers and my sisters of so many traditions, Jewish and Christian and Muslim and Ahmadiyya Muslim and the Baha'is and the Yazidis and the Falun Gong and the Hindus and the Sikhs and I could go on and forgive me if I haven't mentioned you. But I feel, I feel tonight that we are sisters and brothers. I feel that tonight there is this bond and that we really could say to each other, whither thou goest, I will go. You're not going to go there alone anymore. Where you lodge, I will lodge. I'm going to stay beside you. And to me, that's the greatest achievement of this summit. We have listened to brilliant academics and amazing activists and inspiring survivors of persecution and amazing and fantastic leaders like Ambassador Brownback. But the real gift of this gathering has been that we have a pledge to each other. So it is my hope, it is my prayer, and it's my pretty confident feeling in my heart that what Ruth said so many years ago to her mother-in-law, what Harry Hopkins said so many decades ago to a besieged and beleaguered Winston Churchill in England, we can now say to each other. And if we say that, we will prevail in this noble fight for freedom of religion for everyone everywhere, all the time. May God bless you all and thank you.